good afternoon. How's everyone doing? Sean, you ready? Yep. Let's do this. Um, so, uh, good afternoon. Um, we are going to kick this off. Um, so, as healthcare organizations um, must successfully drive to deliver on strategies and achieve higher patient outcomes um, and improve their patient experience, um, they partner with companies like Parveda. And we partner with our clients at the intersection of business, product, and technology to achieve meaningful results and ensure operational ex excellence. And as we push benefits to the hospitals and most importantly to the patients. The healthcare team at Parveda and I truly appreciate um, and really truly appreciate you guys joining us today um, and really excited to share our perspective on natural language processing to you. So, NLP in healthcare is creating new and exciting opportunities in healthcare delivery and patient experience. It won't be long before specialized NLP coding recognition enables physicians to spend more time with patients while hospitals are making insightful decisions based on precise data. In the years to come, we'll hear in the news the possibilities of this tech type of technology as it empowers providers to positively influence health outcomes. You know, the adoption of NLP in healthcare is truly rising. Um, and it's rising in such a way that it, it enables providers to um, search better, analyze, interpret, and the amounts of data that they don't have access to currently. Um, and using these advanced machine learning algorithms, medical algorithms, and NLP technologies across many different technology partners, it really harnesses insight and gives ability to as, as part of data calls it dark data. Um, and as we go through this presentation, you'll see how we believe how we believe how um, organizations will look at dark data. Next slide. Sean, how about a quick intro? Sure. So hi everybody. Uh, I'm Sean. Uh, I'm from Houston. I live in Houston. So like many of you, I find it thrilling to figure out how to use some of this neat technology for practical purposes. Um, so it's, it's been a real joy and, and pleasure to work as a consultant across uh, multiple industries and with a wide variety of people to, to try to do just that. So I'm excited to be here to talk with you a little bit about some of the work we've been doing um, in healthcare and natural language processing. Yeah, thanks, Sean. Um, the last 14 years I've been uh, um, spending, spending a lot of time in healthcare and um, as I spend more time in healthcare, I think as an organization and myself, we learn about the culture. We learn about what really works and what doesn't work. We start to figure out what are the right POCs that will truly immense, bring those immense values to that organization. And, you know, partnering with our, you know, cloud partners and other technology partners, um, it's been really exciting. Um, one of my favorite use cases was, when we helped an organization that had four different um, EMRs and they needed a way to pull all this disparate data together, um, when we actually started streamlining the data and they didn't have to change EMRs, um, they were able to still get the same insight they would have by moving to one standard EMR. Um, and to this day, I still remember that conversation I had with that CIO and CMIO saying, you know, you saved us millions of dollars um, by leveraging technology in a different manner. So, you know, we're excited to really present this um, presentation to you guys. Um, this is a series. We do these monthly at Parveda. So, you know, look for the next one as well. Next slide. Yeah, so, um, you, know, you know, up to 80% of your organization's medical data is untapped, undervalued, and underused. We believe um, that dark data is vastly underutilized. The truth of those those notes, those clinical notes, along with other free form or unstructured pieces of medical data not being fully utilized are, you know, it definitely impacts the patient outcome. And then through care providers spending each hour forming those notes, using these, using these approaches are, are just a small friction of the way that they could really tap into this potential. Um, you know, in 2016 and in 2018, there was an estimated study that 52% of all the data that is stored in the electronic medical records is usually untapped or unrealized. And it's often cited that usually of all of the data that gets put into a healthcare ecosystem, 80% of that volume is un untapped and un underutilized. 
And the clients we're working with, the forward-thinking medical executives, they're really looking at ways to extract value from this dark data. And this unstructured data of such that is included in your progress notes, your referral notes, your operational notes are truly a goldmine of rich patient data. Imagine all the information when a patient comes into your organization and they come in with this stack of paper or they come in with a referral with a PDF document. Majority of that time, that information that's stored there as a new patient is very underutilized. And some organizations are starting to use OCR technologies and others to really start tapping into that. Um, our job at Parveda is to help kind of extract and help you bring to the forefront those elements so that you can actually start achieving better results with that data. And then as data is not typically stored or collected in, into those structured fields, could be some, some areas of like patient reported symptoms. It could be provide, provider observed signs, tumor sizes, cancer staging, detailed information about a diagnosis or procedure, medical family and history, um, social determinants as is a, it's, a, it's a big way right now, and details of definitely current or past medical conditions as we had, we had discussed. So as we move on to the use cases, um, the four main use cases um, that we will be discussing throughout today and the two that we'll definitely hit upon are gonna be improving patient care and then increasing your revenue. And when we think about increasing revenue and what it, what it means, NLP means in revenue cycle management, when we uncovered it, the information con contained in this dark data in, and how to refine that in revenue cycle management by exposing over or under coding billing claims, which could lead to a greater first passive acceptance rate, lower denials, and definitely fraudulent, right? Um, and eventually this analysis could be applied to claims in near real time. And as Sean will show you in a, in a quick screenshot of how NLP is being used at other organizations, we'll actually see how medical coding is gonna be done differently. And some organizations are already tapping into NLP into their revenue cycle workflows and processes. And imagine a computer assisted coding software, right? There's many out there nowadays. And a dark data pipeline like the one we've implemented it at another organization can really start help expanding computerized coding assistance to really start lowering your cost from a resource perspective, but also increasing your productivity and increasing your revenue because of the efficiency of the coding that it could potentially bring to light. And, and you know, not only could it just bring the revenue, it's obviously a correct way of diagnosing your patients. You know, the, the next one I'll talk about, and we'll see a live demo from Sean, um, is gonna be around the patient. Um, and really, what does it mean to improving your clinical operations, right? Um, it takes many different forms in dark data. And the current clinical decision-making systems that use structured data will see a greater value for their unstructured data with this dark data tool set. And with dark data, clinical decision-making systems that can be augmented or enhanced with a richer data set, including signs and symptoms, diagnoses, you start seeing providers starting to tap into that by streamlining their processes and workflows. And you start seeing their recap notes and your hospitalization summaries change, your conversation changes with your patient. And all of this unstructured data can really start providing a boost to that patient experience that hospitals really tend to strive forward. And the way that you look at the triple aim and then you're moving to the quadruple aim nowadays it, only, it also enhances your clinician experience as well. Next slide. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna bog you guys down with more who is Parveda, but what we are doing and what this slide really depicts is our ability to really understand healthcare, but also bringing in elements across many different industries. When you think of NLP and you think of the way modern data platforms are growing and enhancing, it's best to look at what's happening across industries and taking the best of breed across many different sectors. And what this really shows you is that the ability to succeed in healthcare data strategy, there needs to be multiple pillars that need to be realized. And for you to understand or for us to understand the business needs, we really need to understand what are the challenges that hold back innovation or what prevents responses to those key business questions. And really we start asking some of those difficult questions, right? How, are, how can your organization truly transform or truly be digital or truly go towards a digital transformation and not be data driven or scalable or an agile enterprise? How can we as an organization empower you 
as the customer to drive business value, whether it's structured or unstructured data. And as we go into that, we have another framework that dips into the healthcare. Next slide. And as healthcare is a complex sector in itself, right? But the way we envision and the way we build projects and successful healthcare data projects is really starting small and building excitement. And you know, as we start building excitement, we hear from executive stakeholders that you're really, you're really building something for us. You're building something for my institution that's really driving value to our patients, to our providers, and to our operations. And you know, there's many different literature out there around dark data. But our strategy begins with a pilot project that really takes advantage of very periodic, small successes to really spark excitement throughout your stakeholders. And we've shown this across multiple of our healthcare clients that value can be achieved in a matter of, matter of weeks or less than two months. And that, that value can be pushed towards your clinic, to your operations, and to your business stakeholders, right? Your COOs, your CFOs, not just your CIO. And ex as excitement grows through those stakeholders, and as the shared value and the value proposition grows through the organization, additional departments will actually start getting excited and want to learn more as well. So starting small, being value-driven and organic expansion internally as your organization grows, it really starts to really starts to make those complex problems look a lot easier. So there's a lot going on in the slide and, and there's no need, no need for you to go through each box, but as part of it as a cloud agnostic organization, you might have questions around data platforms. And we have our reference architectures that we can help scale your project quickly. And as data platforms, we ask very key questions on how do we address gaps? What are the type of funding that's available? What does your infrastructure look like? What are the capabilities and alignments of your resources that could do achieve the success? Um, at Parveda, a um, interesting quote by a, our, our uh, managing vice president in Houston, um, where she tells us that our job at Parveda is not to be at your client for a very long time. We don't wanna be there for the next 30 years. We wanna be able to address the complex problem the Upman needs and start growing your resources to actually start achieving success in these areas so that as you uncover new problems, we can help you with those newer problems. And while we help knowledge transfer and grow your resources to achieve a dark data pipeline or reference architecture, you're going to uncover other needs where we can start helping you. So as you uncover your reference architectures and you, are, and you need help walking you through an element of this complex problem, our job is to help make those spider webs very streamlined. So a good data governance project, right, would be really helpful. It would help your organization understand what are the ups and downs of an innovate, innovation, innovation type project. Um, is Agile going to be enough to be successful for your organizations? And then we probably end off with something like, do your stakeholders really trust the data that actually exists in your ecosystem? And then um, our last slide before I give it back to Sean um, is really just a thank you to our partners. Um, you know, we, we really believe in our partnerships with all of the firms on this slide and then all of the newer firms that we're talking to right now. Um, you know, we're pretty excited about our growth in healthcare. Um, we've grown a lot in the past three to five years um, and it's and it's in our ability to bring to bring to light and bring to our clients such as you guys um, is to really what can we do to help you? Um, and we understand many organizations are taking a hybrid cloud approach, but being a cloud agnostic organization at Parveda, we're ability to help you showcase the ins and outs of many different vendors and technology partners. And as solutions are getting unfolded into your organization, we need to be there side by side to help you think through. What does it mean to implement this solution into your ecosystem? Will it be successful? So I appreciate you listening to me. Um, before I hand it to Sean, I just wanted to say thank you. Um, and I'll hand it over to Sean. Great, thank you, Mitt. Um, appreciate that broad context. So, so let's talk now a little bit more specifically about some real life examples of using NLP in the healthcare space. Uh, I know there are entire conferences and summits that are dedicated to this, um, but I'd like to show you today just a couple applications uh, that we've seen to be valuable for our clients. 
So <clears throat> let's start, as I mentioned, with uh, the revenue cycle. Um, I'll touch on this just briefly because we have another exciting application to, to talk about. Um, but industry improvements to the revenue cycle using NLP are just on the we're just on the cusp of what's possible there. Uh, and this is going to be a key differentiator for organizations going forward. Um, and, and really what we've seen um, is, as I mentioned, we're just on the cusp of this, but uh, we, we've seen that there's a good um, application here for NLP to really help in raising the quality of claims. Um, so of course, more accurate information in the claim can lead to higher reimbursement rates uh, and lower uh, re claim rejection from payers. So you know, it's really important to start thinking about these uh, potential benefits here. And I just want to show you a quick illustration here of how NLP uh, can take an example encounter note, like the one that you see in the background here, uh, and highlight relevant structured information that could help, you know, whoever's putting the, the billing claim package together, the physician or the coder, um, potentially have a, a more accurate or a more fully supported billing claim. So uh, in this case, you can see that uh, I just picked a couple of examples here, but you can see that NLP is highlighting a couple of these ICD-10 codes uh, in the note, uh, which could potentially help with you know, some bill a billing package and claim uh, claims. So, I mean, there's there's been computer assisted coding for a while. Uh, I think NLP is a is a huge advancement though, over previous pattern matching technologies or other other technologies because it's it's much more adaptive. And it can respond better to you know euphemisms or spelling errors, uh, abbreviations, things like that, where it's just more adaptive to how natural speech is and natural writing is in, in the in the physician space. Uh, so that's just a brief look at you know revenue cycle, revenue cycle, revenue cycle application for NLP. Um, but I'd like to go now more in depth into another use case uh, within improving patient care. So for this one, I'm going to show you a demo, uh, and we'll go into more detail into the technical architecture behind it. So this solution, as I mentioned, improves patient care, and it really focuses in on the interaction between patients and providers. So let me set this up a little bit by telling you about my last visit to a doctor. I went to see an allergist uh, recently for a follow-up. And during the visit, he came in and you know asked me how I was doing uh, and asked me about my symptoms. And as I started talking to him, uh, you can maybe guess what he started doing. Um, I think we've all experienced this. Uh, you know, I start talking and he turns to the computer and puts his hands on the keyboard and does the whole kind of like, uh-huh, uh-huh, right, uh-huh, yep, tell me more. Mm -hmm. And he's not looking at me. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm missing out on that, that connection. And, I, you know, I love my allergist, but boy, wouldn't it be nice if we could really feel connected while we're having that conversation instead of him you know, turning and interacting with the computer and me feeling like I'm you know, speaking to somebody who may or may not be listening, although of course he is. Um, and I think it's also important to, to ask the question, well, why is he doing that? Um, well, it's because he's trying to be efficient with his limited time, right? And he, he wants to go home and have dinner and play with his kids and he doesn't wanna go home and have to chart my visit. Um, so, you know, Parveda has experience working with NLP voice technologies to help in this situation, to reduce some of that physician burnout and really increase that patient and provider experience uh, and help that be better. So I'm gonna show you this example that uses machine learning and NLP to take a situation like that, transcribe the audio, uh, structure the resulting text, and then use that structured text to automatically draft uh, documentation in near real time. And the, the idea is really what I was talking about, which is to let the provider and patient have that eye-to-eye -eye, uh, connection, which really is the reason why a lot of doctors got into medicine in the first place, right? Um, in, in fact, when one of our doctors uh, saw this solution, he said, wow, I can be a doctor again. So I'm gonna show you this little slice of this technology where the patient and the provider are speaking 
and then we'll dissect it a bit. Hi, Sean, what is it that brings you in today? Well, I've had a terrible headache behind my eyes and a stuffy nose. Hmm. Do you have any nasal drainage? I do. I've had some nasal drainage since Thursday. Have you taken any medication for it? Yes, I have. I've been taking some Advil pills twice a day for the past three days and some Sudafedrine, which did seem to help. But is there anything else you could prescribe for me? Well, based on your symptoms, I'm diagnosing you with the common cold, so I typically wouldn't prescribe anything. However, the over-the-counter medication you're taking should work well. Okay, and, and what about my test? All your vital signs and your blood tests came back normal. Oh, that's really good to hear. Mm -hmm. So keep taking the medication you've mentioned, get some rest, drink lots of fluids, and make a follow-up appointment if your symptoms worsen. Okay, thanks, doctor. I'll follow up later this week. All right, so you can see that, you know, over on the right, we're seeing the live conversation, and that's in real time as it's happening. Over on the left, you can see the various uh, concepts that the NLP system is detecting uh, as the conversation happens. So you can see things like personal information, uh, signs and symptoms that are mentioned, anatomy, medical information, um, medications. Uh, it's it's all um, you know it's all there and there instantly in in, in real time. Um, and this is I mean this is incredible stuff. I mean you know 20 years ago, 10 years ago, even five years ago, or sooner. I mean this is uh, this is groundbreaking, right? So. Um, so let's let's actually pull back the, the curtain a little bit and talk about how this is working under the hood, uh, especially since this is a, a text spotlight. So excited to get get into a little bit more of the details here. All right, so here is a high level reference architecture for this solution that could work across various cloud vendors, uh, and we're going to walk through it. So you'll notice first at the top, there's uh, five different concepts that this architecture embodies, right? Secure, cloud-based, real-time, scalable, and extensible. And as I go through and describe this, you'll see how those uh, concepts come to life in this architecture. So uh, well, let's begin on the left side. Uh, in, this, in this case, there's a microphone that's listening to the conversation, uh, and it's interacting with a browser front end. Uh, in, in this case, it's a React single page application front end, uh, which is managing the communication with the microphone. And it's also taking the audio stream from the microphone and pushing that up to a cloud-based transcription service to take that audio and turn it into text. And of course, these transcription services uh, are you know, trained on medical information and um, are uh, continuously improved Right, by the teams that are working on them. So, you know, for for Amazon, this could be Transcribe Medical, uh, you know, as their transcription service, or Azure has a speech to text service. Um, once the once the text has been transcribed, it's sent up to and the front end communicates to a back end API. This back end API is a serverless cluster. Um, that is, in this case, running a, a Node.js TypeScript backend uh, that's managing the data flowing in from the front end of the browser, and then uh, using that data, uh, storing it into a data lake, which you can see in the, uh, in the bottom middle, uh, both object storage, NoSQL data stores uh, here are in use. And there's an opportunity, too, to take this information and put it as part of a unified patient record. Um, so uh, that's, that's a trend we're seeing too, is, is uh, the need for a unified patient record. And companies like Innovacer do this really well. Uh, once the text gets back to that backend, it's time to take it and extract out those relevant medical pieces. And to do that, there's that NLP service in the top right. Um, so you know we can use Amazon Comprehend Medical. Uh, Azure has a text analytics for health as part of their cognitive services they've uh, released. Um, so that's how that piece of the architecture comes into play is taking that text, bringing out the concepts. And again, that is stored in this data lake. 
Um, so one thing that I like to, to mention here too is um, in terms of extensibility, uh, you'll see in the bottom right that there's an integration here with the electronic health record via FHIR, uh, HL7 FHIR. And of course, FHIR is, is exploding in popularity. Um, you'll also see that there's this reporting aspect that can come out of the data lake. So an architecture like this is very extensible to be able to plug into other tools or analysis tools, uh, other systems, uh, to be able to take some of this structured data and utilize it downstream. Um, so just to recap our, our concepts here, so secure, uh, all of this is done in a very um, you know, HIPAA compliant, HIPAA secure way. There's encryption uh, in, at rest and in transit and all of this uh, architecture. There's opportunity here to add in uh, audit trails and data provenance and, and everything that you care about as an IT organization that uh, is HIPAA compliant, right? Uh, I talked a little bit about cloud-based. So, you know, there are huge advantages to taking advantage of some of these cloud services, like in this case, you know, the serverless compute, the NLP service, the transcription service. I mean, I don't know uh, very many medical uh, provider organizations that are going to hire a huge team of, you know, IT data scientists, machine learning experts to come and build their own NLP and transcription services. Uh, but fortunately, there are there are others, cloud vendors, who are doing that, who have huge teams, who have access to a lot of data uh, for highly accurate training, uh, and you're able to take advantage of that as, in a pay-as-you-go model. So, you know, I don't know that this uh, architecture would even be possible um, on a wide scale without leveraging that cloud-based side of it. We mentioned real-time, so uh, in, you know, in our demo, you notice that this is near real time. I mean, the provider, patient, they say something, you can almost instantly see the transcript and almost instantly see the relevant medical concepts. Um, and all of that is enabled through a real-time communication framework. In this case, we're building that on top of WebSockets. Uh, of course, scalable is a consideration for as this, as something like this gets rolled out. So, all parts of this really are nearly infinitely scalable using the cloud. I mean, the, the NLP and transcription services are completely managed for you by, cloud, by the cloud, same with the serverless compute uh, and the APIs. You know, the data lake is nearly, I mean, infinitely scalable. Uh, and, um, you know, really the, really the bottlenecks here would be if you're integrating with any sort of on-prem uh, EHR that you're, you're trying to um, push a lot of data into, of course, that can also be optimized as well. So, I mean, you want to build something with an eye to the future. Uh, so that's what a reference architecture like this is able to do. Uh, finally, we mentioned extensible uh, and that this, this architecture is pretty simple to plug into uh, other downstream systems or even upstream systems to incorporate some context for uh, the conversation back into this experience. Another way that this is extensible is being able to take this architecture and morph it and, and um, adjust it for other use cases. So the demo that I showed was a microphone in a room. But of course, we know that, especially during COVID, there's a huge surge in telemedicine. Um, and, and this architecture, we're not going to go too in depth on this, but the same extensible architecture can be easily adapted to integrate with um, general purpose uh, tools like Chime or Zoom or Teams uh, for telemedicine or even specialized telemedicine tools like CareConvene. So the point is here that you can achieve, you know, these same five goals, uh, being secure, being cloud-based, real-time, scalable, extensible, and the NLP um, benefits that we get here, and we can achieve those with similar architectures to feed uh, different use cases as well. So, you know, we've gone over underlying tech here, 
and technology is foundational to improving the patient and provider experience. But true operational value comes from more than just the technology. Uh, so a viable solution is going to include workflow components, uh, security considerations, change management, legal, and even patient consent implications. Um, and you know we have experience working through through all those um, in implementing solutions like this. So you know there's a broader picture here and broader broader e ecosystem as you look to implement something like this into your organization. Um, you know, but the, the tech is, is foundational uh, in terms of um, making this even possible. So another challenge uh, that organizations typically run into here is, um, is really looking through the huge list of meaningful use cases and, uh, and deciding where to, where to spend your prioritization tokens, right? Where to spend your budget, where to spend your effort. Um, your, your energy. And, uh, you know, we barely scratched the surface in today's presentation of what the use cases are for NLP. I mean, just as an example, uh, here are a whole bunch of use cases for voice uh, and NLP. Uh, whether that's some custom system like we've shown today, or even consumer based, uh, consumer oriented systems like those you see in the top right. Uh, you know, Alexa, Google Home are hugely popular, Cortana, Siri, uh, our, our vo voice assistants, you know, Orbita is helping in that space as well with voice. And there's, there's plenty of opportunities to use voice and NLP. I mean, as you, as you take a look at this circle, and we're not going to go through everything here, but um, transaction execution, um, is is a is a is an amazing opportunity. Search and locate where you're trying to help your patients and providers uh, with finding the the locations, finding jobs, right at your organization. Um, marketing and inform where you're able to take this and and build your brand out in the marketplace, and also teach and educate your patients and providers. There's wellness and prevention support uh, where you're helping to take care of some of those chronic symptoms or long-term care management, uh, treatment and recovery support, right? Where it's actually uh, helping inside of the hospital or inside of the clinic. Um, so there are just so many uh, opportunities here. And this is just with, with voice. And of course, we've talked about how um, dark data in general is something like 80% of all the information and being able to unlock that and use that is much more broad than just voice. Um, but it is, um, it, it's just so expansive. So how do you even start prioritizing? Well, um, three dimensions that, that we typically look at, um, and there are, there are others, but three, I think, primary dimensions to look at here in terms of prioritization are um, one, you want to look at a solution with a large impact. Um, an impact will vary based on your different organizations, but you know, impact uh, and large impact is going to be, I think, a primary concern. Um, two is again going back to that larger context. You know, none of these technology pieces operate in a bubble. Um, who are you going to be working with to implement these use cases and to really drive this forward? So. So stakeholders and considering which stakeholders um, have influence within the organization uh, is another concern to, to think about right, as you're prioritizing as you're prioritizing these. And then on a similar related note, for our, our third consideration here is of course each of these has a cost associated with it. Um, if only we could go and do all this at once, <laughs> right? Um, but we know we can't. We're resource constrained, so. Um, of course, there's an ROI component here in terms of, you know, bang for the buck uh, and how that fits in with uh, available and appropriate budgets. All right, so we've taken you through um, a little bit of context uh, around natural language processing, what it is and what, what, what dark data is and why this is even important. 
Uh, we've gone through a, a couple of, of instances of how this can be applied. We've taken you through a demo uh, and, and talked about the underpinning architecture. And we've also um, talked a little bit about use cases and how you prioritize those. So I do think we have a couple minutes here now for questions. So Amit, um, do you want to say anything to kind of finish this up and tell us how the QA and A is going to work? Yeah, I, thanks, Shai. Um, so the way that we'll work the Q and A is um, really leveraging either the the Zoom chat or the LinkedIn um, as for Q and A. Um, Leslie will probably need some help to see what questions are on the uh, the uh, LinkedIn, but the ones in the Zoom, I get we could actually start walking through. Um, and feel free to feel free to ask the question. So, um, Sean, I think a really good question um, is around. I think talking about the confidence level for NLP, um, and you know, this is a question that you have received multiple times as we've built out this platform at multiple clients now. Um, maybe you could take two to three minutes to talk about how do we account for errors, and then also talk about maybe the null too. Sure. So, so yeah, this, I mean, NLP is not perfect. <laughs> um, I mean, you know, you see uh, machine learning <clears throat> out in the real world, like, you know, Tesla and Waymo are trying to use machine learning algorithms to, to drive. And we're seeing that that's not perfect. And the, the NLP in this case isn't perfect either. So, you know, there is a consideration of, okay, well, what do you do? How do you, how do you supervise it? Um, and what do you do when it's not perfect? Um, and typically, um, this again goes back to kind of that piece that's ancillary to the tech. Typically, what we will do is build in a, um, a human in the loop uh, review. So, in the case of this of this uh, example demo that I gave, there's actually a, a, a spot afterwards where, when the documentation is automatically generated, and even before that where the physician um, is able to go in and, um, and this is where you, you've got to get the user experience really, really highly tuned, but is able to go in and make some quick adjustments to uh, deal with any of those errors or, or um, you know, miscommunications with the system that come up. So that is an important piece. Um, and you know, it's really at that stage all about optimizing for the user experience to make it a smooth, streamlined flow. Yeah, thanks, Sean. Um, another question we had um, was around how can we experiment with this technology? Um, and what I'll share with you is that we've had about three to four clients where this question is pretty relatable to their healthcare system. And healthcare systems are obviously concerned about changing a provider or even just a MARN workflow without really experimenting it. So whether you have an innovation center or whether you have a area of that you try to test or demo products, you can build these products in such a manner that you're not having to implement them into your Epic or Cerner, Allscripts, Meditech, whatever your EMR is, at that point, you could build it in such a, a way that you could import a small data set or you could work with a small group of physicians. Um, in most cases, our stakeholders vary from six to 10 at the initial onset, and then they really start growing as the model starts growing. Um, and what you can do is that when you start having the foundation laid and you start building the architecture, you're going to have to adjust the architecture to make it sure it fits your healthcare ecosystem. So what I'd say is that in the first six to eight weeks, you build it, um, you build it for your organization, you build it without connecting it into Epic or CERN or any big EMR, you ability, the ability to actually make it work, make sure the microphone works, make sure the NLP works, make sure that it can keep up with the doctor's voice and the, the speed they dictate or they talk, um, one of our clients had a doctor and we wanted him to break it. And he came in and spoke so fast with the dictation note, he broke our system. And we needed, we had to refine and retool the voice. So what I'd suggest is maybe, you know, less than eight weeks, really build a platform for yourself that works for your ecosystem, that works for your organization. Um, the key here is building something for your providers and your patients, because every workflow, even though outcomes may be similar, out 
the workflows are different. Um, and then really start thinking about what are those integrations into your EMRs. Um, Sean, yeah, can I just add on to that too? Yeah. yeah. Um, so, you know, you're, uh, everything Amit said is, is spot on. From a more technical perspective, um, in pure, in terms of pure experimentation, I mean, the cloud cloud providers have made this actually really easy to just, um, you know, sign up for an account or go into an existing account and start experimenting it right away with ad hoc requests and ad hoc data. Um, so you know, you, you could get somebody who has um, some some sample data, some test data, and it's really easy to just go into the respective consoles. Um, of the cloud providers and just start experimenting with, hey, how does this, how does this particular sample node that I have, um, you know, manifest itself after it's run through the NLP? And you can start even from there. And, and actually, you know, our recommendation is to start with something like that so that you can build excitement. Because once you start, once you start taking um, some notes uh, or some, some sample data and piping it through, you're able to really showcase, hey, look at what, look at how this is coming out, how we could use this. And that's when you start getting that core group that Amit was talking about on board um, and, and really getting excited about taking this and rolling this out more broadly. And then keep the ball rolling, Sean. Um, you know, double question here. How are we handling compliance with HIPAA? Um, and then I think, uh, I think what we could add on there as well is uh, patient consent. Um, on how we're handling that and working with key stakeholders uh, in an organization. Yeah, so I mean, this is really important. Uh, HIPAA, HIPAA and, and patient privacy and patient consent is all really important. So, um, you know, before, before piping any uh, real protected health information through a system like this, uh, you want to have those bases covered. Um, the cloud, you know, all of the cloud uh, providers, the major cloud providers, have really good resources on HIPAA compliance using their technologies. Um, so you do want to make sure that you are following their recommended guidelines for how to use a particular service, uh, what configuration settings you need to change to make sure that it will, it will um, be used in the way that they have designed it to be used for data like protected health information. Um, and they have a whole slew of certifications and um, you know, audits that, that can be looked at to, to validate that they're going through their due diligence in, in that. But of course, usually with the cloud, there's a kind of a shared responsibility model where, um, you know, as you're architecting these solutions, you also have to put safeguards in place as well and architect it correct, correctly. Um, so in cases like this, I mean, especially making sure that uh, data motion through the system is tracked, uh, that data motion and, and stored through the system is also, um, you know, encrypted and unable to be, um, you know, decrypted uh, if it were to be, you know, lost for whatever reason. Um, and we've actually designed this to where we minimize the risk of anything happening, um, as this is really one, one option is to take a system like this and make it a more of a pass through for data. Um, so there's not a lot of long-term data that's living in the system. Um, and, and then you know, having that data really end up in those systems of records like the electronic health record for the, the long-term storage. Um, and then on the, on the patient consent side, um, yes, this is, a, this is a new area for, uh, for a lot of people. Um, and we've seen some of that in the in the broader ecosystem with facial recognition and things like that um, in terms of you know, machine learning and artificial intelligence. Um, so it's critical to work with organizations, legal teams um, to get patient consent. There's various ways of doing that. Uh, we have seen it work where uh, there are additional clauses you know, from a legal perspective added into the documentation that the, the patient will sign um, and then we also recommend having just a checkpoint moment at the beginning of any conversation, whether that's telemedicine or another conversation in the clinic between a patient and provider, where the provider just says, hey, 
I'm going to be using this system. It's going to, you know, help me focus on you. Um, is that okay? And to just get kind of a final confirmation there before, um, you know, before using that. And that, and that's also something that will also help with patients' trust in the system. You know, if their provider is telling them, "Hey, I'm going to use this system. It's going to be, you know." wonderful is going to really enable us to have a, a deeper conversation um, and that will actually also provide an opportunity for the patients to trust the system more and then you know usage and adoption increases yeah i and you know you you touched on it that majority of our partners that you saw on the earlier slides they are um, hipaa approved platforms so they do help standardize across hipaa um, and phi and I think the other element is that majority of the partners will have their own um, specialized resources um, that will actually support your implementation or design or architecture. And even before anything would go live, there would be um, QAs and checks, um, ability to make sure that everything fits the way it should fit from a security standpoint. So good question. I. Um, Another question um, is around Spanish speaking um, and English and other languages. Um, it's, it's really what's out there in the market. Um, there are cloud vendors and partners that are starting to expand their language offerings. Um, here in Texas, Spanish is a maybe a first or second language here for most. Um, and there are products out there now that are helping with this from a telemedicine perspective. Um, there is a a version of uh, like a Zoom or Chime Teams type of um, platform that's been released that is a um, Spanish speaking platform. So you could potentially use an SDK and integrate into a platform like that if you had a larger interpretive services type of organization. I think NLP will be definitely an area where interpreter services could be an area of benefit, thinking about how you could incorporate that onto an iPad or a mobile device and have a full-blown conversation um, from English to Spanish, Spanish to English, um, leveraging the tool that you saw earlier with e-visits. Um, so good question there too. Um, you know, another question we see here in this chat is um, just clinic capacity. Um, and I think that's a good one, right? Um, and the reason, I, the reason I think it's a good question is, um, the platform for ambient listening or e-visits in the patient room um, can help with um, throughput for patient loads. But I think the element that you'd want to address first is really that patient provider experience. Um, and the reason I say that is that it's going to be a learning curve for most providers and patients to have a mechanism of voice being captured in a room where you're not having to sit in, type out your notes or you know, click through your progress note that, hey, you have this diagnosis or you have this ICD-10 code or you have these allergies. Um, I think initially what I would say is that I think in the future it would, it would help with clinic capacity. I think your throughput would be higher, but I think your initial onset is going to be definitely more of the experience and the fact that you're able to um, really build that intimate relationship eye to eye with your patient. So um, I think in the long run, yes. I think in the short term, what you're going to see is that experience. Um, let's see here. Sean, maybe you could talk about the, since it's a tech spotlight, um, you know, there's a question here that says, you know, you talked about a need for a good data platform. Or sorry, we answered that one actually, sorry. <laughs> uh, platform. What cloud infrastructure do we need to successfully execute um, this ambient listening or e-visits platform on? The, the major yeah. cloud providers um, will support this, this use case. Um, it's gonna be more difficult if you're trying to do it um, on-prem uh, with tools that you have to install yourself. Um, and uh, the reason is kind of like I alluded to in, in the presentation, um, just that uh, you know there are there are continual updates to these services. They've got large teams, they've got lots of data to train on, um, and so they're able to put a really high quality product out there. 
um, that then you can very easily consume in an API based format um, that's pay as you go. You just send them text and they send you back a JSON payload of uh, everything that you, you need um, to make sense of that text. Um, so, you know, in terms of what, what specific cloud infrastructure you would need, well, you need some sort of compute and we've gone the road of a serverless compute. Um, you'd need the, you know, the NLP and transcription services. You need some storage um, as well. And then some way to communicate with, with the client and device. So those are the high level cloud components you would want to build into your solution. Yeah, um, thanks, Sean. I think we got we got enough room here for next, three more questions. So uh, we had a question from LinkedIn. Um, it said, any case studies where this technology has been tested and adopted by hospitals and academia? Um, do you want to take it or you want me to? Uh, go ahead. Yeah, um, so we, we are currently partnering with a large healthcare organization that has evolved this use case into something of a almost a production ready tool. Um, and they built it for their organization, for their workflows and their processes. Um, and in current, currently, this organization um, is taking it from infancy where they demoed it to 200 plus key stakeholders. Um, and built a ton of excitement. And even through the mists of COVID, um, they were able to bring this project back. Um, it was, I think they started last July, I think, right, Sean? Sometime in July. And they brought this project back to life, knowing the importance of this. And the reason why they brought it back is they believe as an organization that voice is going to change the way that they evolve patient experience. And not only do they want to involve patient experience, they also want to evolve the clinician experience. Um, and when you evolve the clinician experience, you do many different things there. You know, one question was about throughput. I, throughput's a definitely a long term, but the initial the initial is the innovation, the ability to build that relationship with that patient, the ability to that patient walking away and saying, "Man, I just had this greatest experience at this organization. You should definitely go check it out." the ability to be accurate um, and have a dictated note that says, here's what I talked about. This is what I heard. The doctor was present. He was mindful of what I was trying to say and he listened, he or she listened to me. That is the experience they're trying to shape at this organization. And in, in the state of Texas, there's many hospitals. So it's just to, take, to get that competitive advantage, that value proposition, this organization is definitely trying to really take leaps and bounds to make sure that they are staying competitive um, in this arena. So, you know, there are there are plenty of organizations that are starting to adopt this technology, um, and there, this organization is sometime this summer or late summer um, should be going live with some of their voice applications in their ambulatory practices. So, it's going to be a really exciting time. Um, I think it's going to be definitely a, lar a pretty big learning curve. And as you heard from Sean, a pretty big change adoption strategy. Um, but I think as, as it was with the EMR 10, 20, 20, 30 years ago, there was a large curve, right? Physicians didn't want to go and put in the problem list or the ICD-10 codes. They didn't have to do all these things on paper. They could have their nurses or MAs or someone else do it. And just like technology evolves, the people need to evolve too, right? Processes will change. Regulatory will change. Things will change. Look at the way telemedicine adapted to COVID, right? So I think there's going to be a change. Um, I think voice will be a, a major impact into that. Um, we've got two, two more questions. Um, you know, we, the question here is you shared a lot of ideas that represent voice platform opportunities in healthcare. How critical do you think it is to make early stage voice platform decisions that allow for extension into many of those areas versus having different technology stacks for each solution area if a foundational platform is not defined first. Sean, do you wanna take it from a tech perspective? Sure. Uh, and this is a really good question. I mean, this is the conundrum of any emerging tech, right? I mean, you, you, want, to, you want to invest in something that's gonna be good for going forward. But at the same time, things are changing so rapidly that, um, 
you know, you, you want to get the benefits early without waiting for things to stabilize. So, I mean, it, it kind of is a, a polarity that you have to, that you have to manage. Um, I think this is probably dependent a little bit on the organization itself and how, um, how adaptable the organization is as those changes come. I mean, if you start with like a different tech stack for each solution area, you could get some quick wins. Um, and then uh, maybe after, after some period of time, you can take a, a pause and say, okay, now that we've, we've kind of experimented with some of these things and we know what's valuable, we know what's not valuable. Now let's take an opportunity to consolidate and turn that into a, a, a more stable strategy going forward. Um, so, you know, my, I think it depends a little bit on the organization, how, how able they are to make that sort of retrospective look and adapt going forward. Um, and I think if you have an organization that's able to do that, um, probably the, the, the best approach that, you know, in my opinion, uh, is to start with these different tech stacks, get quick wins, because it's not, like Amit said at the beginning, it doesn't take a super long time to set up <clears throat> um, the core of this technology. Um, so if you're able to make some, you know, have some quick wins and then stop and pause and say, okay, now we know a little bit more about how this works within our organization. Let's invest in a more stable data platform going forward. Yeah, agree. And, you know, and even if you needed to have that conversation earlier, right, to really understand is your data platform or even your reference architecture, is it in, a, in an area where it can handle something like this? Or it's a conversation about having a, a, a tough conversation internally and just saying, do we need to enhance our, our platform to innovate? Um, so it's really, it's really asking some of those harder questions internally as an organization, um, and then working with your, with your teams and collaborating on where to move next. Um, looks like we have two more questions. Um, have you had any hardware related challenges and do you have any guidance from those challenges? Um, I'll start this one and then this is a pretty funny story. Um, when we were experimenting, um, Sean, and, Sean and the team, we, were, we had to go to different mic shops. We def went to different guitar shops. We went, to, we went to different like Best Buys and whatever electronic shop we had in the, the city of Houston. And we, we bought different things. We tested different things. We, de we tested far field mics, we tested low low mics, we tested mics that, you know, connect to your lapel mics. And at one point, I think Sean probably knew more about microphones and headphones than, you know, an artist. And I think it was pretty cool. Um, and we look back on that moment and Sean and I are like, man, that was a pretty cool thing we just learned. And part of it is all about growing and learning, but that was an area I don't think I ever would have thought I would have learned something so quickly in life. But, um, and Sean even had like this whole like, PowerPoints, a spreadsheet maybe that had like multiple rows and talked about each of the different mics and why it works and why it doesn't work in a hospital. But there are challenges. Every, every, every room is built differently. Your walls are different. Um, the way your physicians talk very soft or loud are different. So really understanding the, your room makeups, your facilities, knowing where you could place a mic in your room, your, your, your infrastructure challenges, so there, there is a lot of those. Any guidance that I could give is that it's a really, it's really trying multiple different things. And you know, different clinics with different groups of physicians will need different hardware. Um, and, and that's just the case. I think it's one microphone or one type of technology will not fit all. I don't know, Sean, if there's anything else fun to add there, but I remember- Well, I'll just say, yeah, that's good. Um, I'll just say that it was- <clears throat> It was funny because early on when we were doing one of these particular projects uh, and we're trying to narrow in on the microphone, <clears throat> uh, we were we were doing a demo for a bunch of people in this you know cl clinician room, and um, usually when you do a technical demo, you know that things will go worse or things will go wrong during the demo. Everything will work perfectly beforehand, and then you'll do the demo and things will something will happen and it'll go wrong. But it was funny because it was actually the opposite for doing these demos with the microphones because, you know, 
uh, once you have a demo in a small room, you bring a whole bunch of people in to see it. There's a lot of bodies in there and it actually changes the acoustical properties of the room so that it picks it, it picks it up better. At least it did right in our early stages when we were doing some of these testing. So actually the system would work better during the demo than it did beforehand. So that was, that was kind of unique and pretty fun experience. Yeah, um, it looks like we're at time. So if we go to the last slide. So um, this was our tech spotlight for natural language processing. As I alluded to early, earlier in this deck um, or into this, this webinar, we do these every month. Um, we try to have fun with it. Um, Sean and I have really found a passion with NLP. Um, really, how does it impact not just the patient, but a organization as a whole? Um, we're, as you can tell, we're pretty passionate. Um, it really energizes us as a, as a team, but as an organization and really helping healthcare organizations um, tap into their dark data. So, you know, we, we both are available via LinkedIn. Um, if you wanna reach out to us, look at the email right here, healthcare at parvetasolutions.com. We're happy to uh, connect further um, and really bring this to life. So thank you guys. Yes, thanks everyone, it's been a pleasure.